name is Dr. Jennifer Lee Disney, and I am here with Miss Mary Kate Frarley Glasser, the South Carolina Mother of the Year from 2008. And we are so honored to have you with us. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here and very proud to be the South Carolina Mother of the Year. So proud. Let's take a few minutes and have you just begin by telling us when and where you were born and raised and a little bit about your early childhood. I'd like to tell you about my two very special grandmothers, Alice Caldwell Bell and Catherine Edwards Rogers. I'm named for Catherine, but Kate comes from her. I was born, my mother was Iola Mary Rogers from Marion, South Carolina. When she finished college, she went to Guthriesville in York County to teach. And there she met and fell in love and married Caldwell Bell, who was my father. Because mother was from Marion, she went back home to have me. So I was born in Florence at McLeod's Infirmary. September the 3rd, 1925. Then, of course, we went back to Guthriesville and had a, a wonderful life in a, a village, a farming village. My daddy had a store and my granddaddy had the depot and it was just a wonderful community. But the main part of the community was the Bethesda Presbyterian Church. And there I got my spiritual background. I loved going to Sunday school, vacation Bible school, worship, picnics. It was there that I learned the catechism. I learned that God made me and that he wanted me, he loved me and wanted me to glorify him with my life. And that has been my faith. I, um, when I was two year, when I was two and a half years old, my brother was born. And we lived in Guthriesville until I, well, I go back a little bit. I joined the church. I wanted to join the church early, and they wouldn't let me mm -hmm. until I was nine years old. I made my profession of faith at the best of Presbyterian Church. My brother was born when I was two and a half years old. But when I was ten years old, we lost our father. So after a very difficult year with mother and the two children alone, she decided to take us back to Marion to live. So we lived in my old, my grandmother's old home. I loved Marion and that's where I finished high school. I was, I loved school, always did. And in high school, I was editor of the high school paper. I was Winthrop's Miss High Miss. I was on the student council. During that time, we moved from our town house, my grandmother's home, out to the farm. And we could rent the house in Marion. Times were hard. We were getting through the Depression. And the war was coming on. And I drove every day from four miles, the farm, out four miles from Marion into high school. <clears throat> when I was four years old, 
I visited my Aunt Margaret's classroom. And I knew right then that I wanted to be a teacher. Then at everywhere I went, I wanted to teach. I taught my dolls. <laughs> I taught the little children on the farm on Sunday afternoon. We had a Sunday school class. I can hear them right now singing, Jesus Loves Me. Then we moved to Marion, and I was a member of the Marion Presbyterian Church. I knew I wanted to be a teacher, and so it was very appropriate that I would choose Winthrop, was the school for teachers then. I was planning to major in English until a friend of mine said, you need to major in business, and then you can always get a job if you can't teach English. And so I busied myself and got a scholarship to Winthrop. And I majored in business. BS in commerce, they called it then. Now it would be business education. <clears throat> Did my student teaching at Rock Hill High School wow. and just loved it. And I loved Winthrop. I was a freshman counselor. I was on in the Senate. I was chairman of the worship for the college in the YWCA. I had charge of Vespers and um, any prayer services and blessings. And I was asked one time to speak at the highway of North and South Carolina over in Johnson Hall. I had already made up my mind that I was going to be a teacher in the church. And so I had applied at the Presbyterian School of Christian Education in Richmond and had received a scholarship to teach typing at the school. And I that I had told the registrar's office not to recommend me for a job because I was going on to school. But when I finished my talk with the, the students in Johnson Hall that day, the marshal came up to me with a note, go to the registrar's office. So immediately I went to the registrar's office to tell them there had been a mistake. <laughs> they were not supposed to recommend me for a teaching job because I was going on to Christian School of Christian Education. And I wanted really to be a missionary to the Congo wow. or be a DCE in a church. Wow. Everywhere I went, I helped with the Sunday school. In Marin, I helped with the, the Sunday school that we had out at the mill. In Winthrop, I helped with the Sunday school for, at the Red River. I think it's the River School, the little Indian children near Rock Hill. But anyway, when I got out to meet this man that had come to interview me, Mr. Keller, and I said, I'm just so sorry, but this is a mistake. I am not planning to teach now. And he was a very persistent man. He said, well, you can, you can wait for two years and then go to Richmond. And I said, no, I already have my scholarship. And he just, he just kept telling me how wonderful Allendale was. I'd never heard of it. I was from Marion, had been to school in Rock Hill, didn't know where Annandale was. And he said, it's just a nice little town. We have a wonderful school. We have good salaries, small classes, wonderful parents. You've just got to come teach 
in Allendale. Kept saying no, but finally Mr. Keller said, well, would you just come visit one weekend? He said, we will invite you and give you a nice place to stay and let you see our school and meet the community. Well, I had always believed that God had a plan for my life. And when I was at Winthrop, I wrote the essay, the professor had us write an essay on what we wanted our lives to be. And this is what I wrote. May the 1st, 1944. I want my career to consist of teaching in the church as well as in the public schools. It will be a career that can be followed all my life. I plan to travel in Europe. I want to marry a minister. I hope to become a mother, still teaching in one way or another, and my life will be spent. I've read and studied and prayed, and in the scripture in Jeremiah I read, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And God had a stronger plan than I did. <laughs> and I went to Allendale and had a wonderful time, enjoyed it so much, and told Mr. Keller that I would come to be the business teacher in the high school there. I told Richmond School that I would delay my coming for my Christian education certificate. I just loved Allendale, and, and it was just like a big, happy family. Um, I, of course, thought a good teacher should visit in all the homes and should go to church. I joined the Allendale Presbyterian Church and had my Sunday school class there. And a young minister from the seminary in Decatur was the supply pastor and came every two weeks for services. I won't go into it, but we became very good friends. <laughs> and after two years, we were married. And then I had to stop teaching the rules for the district were once a teacher is married, she's no longer employed. They wanted her full-time attention in the schools, I guess. But this is interesting. I told the board when I resigned that I was not going to be married until October of the following year. And the board said, well, since you started as a single person, you can finish the year as a married teacher. <laughs> and that I did. And while I was, we were in Allendale, Cecil had four churches, Barnwell, Williston, um, Allendale, and Boiling Springs, a little country church. We didn't have enough young people in any church to have a youth group activities but I suggested that we combine them and form the WABs and meet once a month in each church. And all the young people enjoyed that and loved it. And when I see them today, they still remind me of the WABs and the good times we had. But, um, and I, our first, oh, after I couldn't teach anymore, since I had a business degree, I worked for two lawyers. It's a substitute, really, for the, as they needed me to fill in when the, uh, the lawyers needed help. And sometimes I transcribed divorce cases. I got $5 for each case. 
our first son was born while we were in Annandale. He was born in Augusta because we didn't have a hospital in Allendale. His name is William DeBose Braley, born in June 19, 1950. And after we left Annandale, we went to 96. There's a little town near Greenwood. And I cried all the way. I'd had my first career, my first home, met my husband, had my first baby. Just loved Annandale. But I promised to go where he went. And we moved to 96. And I enjoyed it, but I didn't get out as much. I helped in the church, and I was a member of the music club, and I had good neighbors and good friends. And our second son, was born while we were there. Eighteen months later, Bob Robert Montgomery Braley was born in Greenwood, one of the first born in South Memorial Hospital there. And uh, after th three years, a pulpit committee came from Columbia to 96 to ask my husband to take a job at a church in Columbia, and I did not want to go. I, I was a country girl, and I thought I might have to wear shoes in the city. <laughs> and I didn't think the city was a place to raise children. But don't you know, God won again, <laughs> and we moved to Columbia, and Cecil was the founder of the the first pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Columbia. And we enjoyed that. We lived in a manse next door to the church. And one day, an elder came to, the, to our house and said that the kindergarten director had resigned to take a better job, and this was in August and they needed a director of the kindergarten immediately. And I had a teacher's certificate, be it high school, but I could play the piano and they wanted me. And I always felt that if I were asked to do something, it was a calling from God. Mm -hmm. And I thought I should take that job since I was next door to the church and it was just half day. And so I did. By then I think I had a little girl. Her name was Margaret, our Aunt Margaret, Margaret Rogers Braley. And she was in the kindergarten. But since I was a high school teacher, I knew I had to get early childhood training. I felt like if I was going to do a job, I should be prepared. So I started taking courses at the university in elementary. Just every now and then, I would go to, to play, take a course. But while I was at the kindergarten at the church one day, a lady came from the orthopedic school in Columbia and said that I had been recommended to her to teach kindergarten at the orthopedic school. And I said, but I'm not certified. Well, you can get a certificate for, a temporary certificate and get your certificate. So anyway, that, that was all right. So we were leaving the church. My husband was taking a job as district executive secretary, but it's a sort of a district job with all the churches of Congaree Presbytery. And we had to buy a home, and we thought it was best for me to go ahead and take a job, and I did, and still took courses at the university from time to time to get my certificate. 
and then, and see, I didn't even apply. I never applied for a job. I can't believe it. Taught all those years and never applied for a job. But anyway, um, then the district called me in one day and said, we want you to go to the hearing handicap school and be head teacher there. I said, well, I don't know anything about teaching but there. And they said, well, you will be supervisor and you will be in charge of the school and just teach half a day. So I went and I taught there as head teacher for two years. And there were some years in between. I think I took a leave of absence one time from the orthopedic school, but I went back. They came to me and asked me to come back. But anyway, I was at the school for the deaf. I was there two years. When they called me into the office again, I thought, what do they want with me? They said, the state has passed the law that all children go to public school. And so our Happy Time Center, near where I live, was going to be made into a public school. It was a little private school that the parents could transport the children. The teachers were not certified. They didn't have buses. The parents could pay for the school. But anyway, I prayed about it and thought about it, and, and that was a demanding job. But I took it. I thought, well, maybe God has a plan for me and this school. So I went, and I'm still going to the university now, taking courses in special education. And I just couldn't believe how, I would, don't believe I would have done it had I known how difficult it was. But I had to tell my teachers that they could no longer teach there unless they became certified. We had to get buses because parents had taken the children. Now we had children off the streets, ages five to 16. And I had to tell the wonderful volunteers in the district that the Junior Women's Club couldn't teach anymore because they weren't certified. We, we had a lot of work to do. Had to write a curriculum. There was not a curriculum for special children then. This was really pioneering. And after two years, we just, we just outgrew little happy times. So the district said we will take the older children and put them in an old closed hospital. And I said, well, I will stay here with the younger ones because that's where my office was. And Jim Bagnum was the head teacher there. We were just head teachers then, we weren't principals. And after two years, no, after one year, he was over there, one, two years, they, the district called in and said, we're going to put you in a district building, in a school building. So I was on the committee to help pick a building that would suit my children. And we found Fairwall Elementary School that had been closed. And we moved, they moved the older children there for one year. And the next year, mine came, the younger ones. And that is the first time that I applied for a job. And they said, we're going to advertise for a principal of Fairwall. Mm -hmm. And they picked three people. And I did apply. They asked me why did I want to apply, and I told them because they were my children. Right. 
But anyway, they called me at 10.30 one night after the board meeting to tell me that I had been elected principal of Fairwall School. Really, it was called Center then because it wasn't a regular elementary school. And that building was in bad need of repairs. Had to paint, had to get heating, air. It was a tremendous job. And to find special ed teachers was an answer to prayer. I would pray that a law student moved in from Mississippi and had a wife that could teach special ed. But anyway, we had a very wonderful school and wrote our curriculum and many, many visitors from other schools were coming to see what we were doing at Bell. That it was, it was, uh, I'm just so proud. And the district was so supportive. They said, anything you want, we will get you. And the superintendent and the board member came one day and visited and when they left, they said, what do you want? And I said, well, we need an activities building and kind of laughed because I was being facetious. And when they left, they said, you will get your activities built. They built me a beautiful gym with classrooms and bathrooms. We taught bathing and we used that building so much. It was just wonderful. They loved coming to our graduations and our children were so, so special. But back then, people didn't really appreciate special education like they do today. When people would ask me what I taught and I would say special ed, they'd say, oh, like, you can't do anything else. But I went to my Bible and Jesus said, inasmuch as ye do it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye do it unto me. And I wanted those children to have everything the Braley children had. We even flew to Charlotte on a field. You had to fight for them because I saw an ad that Eastern Airlines was giving a special rate to seniors. And so I called and got tickets for eight of my seniors to go to Charlotte, to fly to Charlotte. And when I went down to pick up the tickets, they asked me how old the students were, and I said 20 and 21. They had lengthened the age of the students. to I had them from four to 21. And my seniors were 20 and 21. And they said, well, we are very sorry, but we can't give you tickets because they are adults now. They are too old to be seniors in high school. And I said, but this is the law in South Carolina, and my children deserve this senior privilege. They wouldn't hear to it. So I went back to school and asked my secretary to take this letter to Frank Bowman, Beerman, I think was his name, and I wrote the president of Eastern Airlines and told him that my children needed that field trip. And in three days, I got a call to come pick up the tickets. But, um, and I loved my children and we, we had a wonderful school. But then after 11 years, I retired, but with a certificate to teach elementary, high school, trainable, profound, mm -hmm. um, administration. My su supervisor at the university said you should take enough certification for administration wow. too and so I could be principal. And so then one night after I had retired, I thought I was all through. I got a call from Columbia College. <laughs> Is your certificate still good? We need you to come supervise clinical students. Mm -hmm. And I did and enjoyed that. So I loved teaching mm -hmm. anything from kindergarten to college. I would love, and in church, anywhere I could teach. What an amazing, I mean, your life experience, that testimony from teaching your dolls to teaching every age, kindergarten adult, special ed, high school principal. 
and you went where you were called. That's right. You didn't apply for jobs, you were called. Never you dreamed I would be doing something like that. Right. Never dreamed I could do something like that. Only with the grace of God could I, because I prayed so much. I just prayed so much. How did you balance all of those wonderful career opportunities with raising your children? How did you balance being a wonderful mother and working inside the home with being a wonderful teacher to all these kids outside the home? Was that difficult? No, it was so natural. <laughs> I loved my children wherever they were. And they helped me. We helped each other. I was going to school, I was working, they were going to school, they were working. We had, we had so much fun, we had such a good time, and I had such good children. They were all so smart and so caring and so loving. When we brought the little girl home, my second son ran out to the car. The children couldn't visit me in the hospital, so they hadn't seen the little girl. And little Bob ran out and opened the door to the car, and I no seat belts or anything. I was holding her in my arms. And he said, oh, Mommy, now we have a baby lady. <laughs> and she's always been our baby lady. And one day I heard her whimpering. I knew it was time to feed her. I went to the bathroom to wash my hands and I looked down and Bob had taken that little few weeks old baby in his arms like this and I nearly fainted but I didn't want to hurt mm -hmm. him. So I said, oh Bob, and he knew I was distressed. He said, but mama was crying. Oh, he was taking mama. care of her. But they all loved each other and they helped. We had a son and another son. All the 50s, I was having Brellies. Bill in 50, Bob in 51, Margaret in 55, and John in 59. Mm -hmm. And uh, they helped each other. Bob never had a new coat because he always wore Bill's. But he never complained that his wasn't new. He was so proud to be in his big brother's coat. Mm -hmm. You know, a positive attitude goes a long way. And the children loved me and they helped me. And I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning to study because at night I was with the children or too tired. Mm -hmm. And every day I planned a time to be with each child alone and I was a great believer in all the children being together with me. We always had a warm breakfast together. And we ate at home. We played at home. We had little league ball games. We had scouts. The boys were Eagle Scouts. Um, and then it was time to go to college. In 1972, I finished my master's at the university. Bill finished his Bachelor of Science at Presbyterian College, and Margaret finished high school. So we were all helping each other. And the children learned to work, to share, to save, and to be thankful for what they had. We didn't have everything given to us. We had to, to work. And, and help, and is am I running out of time? And get, and those things can't be bought. And uh, now, let's see, where did I go from college? Oh, I was going to tell you that three of the, the three sons that went to Preston College graduated summa cum laude. And Margaret finished Winthrop in three years, magna cum laude. Wow, you must be so proud. I am so thankful, but it was God's grace. And they learned to be thankful for what they had and to, to work and to help each other. And we were always faithful to the church. And we were always in worship and we always had our prayers and worship at home. Let me ask you this. Tell me, what does motherhood mean to you? 
When Bill was born, I just could hear the words of scripture saying, take this child and raise it for me. I, I was thrilled, thrilled to have a son. It changed my life completely to have a, a baby. But I always had a responsibility for training that child, not only for this life, but for eternity. And we were always very close. We prayed with the children, and we worked with the children. Motherhood made me appreciate my mother more because she was a wonderful mother. And when I, I started out by telling you my grandmother's, then I didn't really finish. I wanted to tell you about Catherine that I'm named for, had, had nine children. One died in infancy, but her husband died, I think in his 50s. But she sent all eight children to college. I thought that was amazing. That was amazing. And then three went to service in World War II. Mm -hmm. No, it was World War, yeah, two. And, and one was killed in France. Mm -hmm. So she was the first gold star mother. But I thought a remarkable woman, very, very spiritual. And I, my other grandmother was too. And, I had a wonderful background. I uh, see now why you were named the South Carolina Mother of the Year. Why? Your life, ex <laughs> I mean, t tell us what that meant. What did that mean to you to be named for the South Carolina Mother of the Year? What was that experience like, your award winning year? Well, it was the greatest honor I ever had, I think. I say that. But it was amazing. I was surprised, I was overwhelmed. But then I felt that it was a responsibility mm -hmm. to represent the mothers of the state of South Carolina that I loved. I'd always been here, never been anywhere else, lived anywhere else. And uh, it was such a joy and so much happiness. And I wanted my children to be close to me, to each other, of course, first of all, to the Lord. And they all were very active in the church. And love each other and help each other. And to serve the community. Like good scouts and good leaders. They were leaders in the schools and leaders in the church. And God just blessed me with such good children. Mm -hmm and I give him the credit, and I give them the credit mm -hmm. for working hard and, and serving their communities. And now you want me to tell you what they do now? I would love to hear that. Bill, we came from a family of ministers, and Bill thought perhaps he should become a minister. But when he was at Presbyterian College, they realized his love for science. And so he majored in biology, I think. But anyway, he went on to medical school and has served as a doctor, a physician in Lexington for many years. I can't believe he's now retired. Mm -hmm. But um, Bob went to Christian College and felt, decided he was gonna be a teacher. So he went to the University of South Carolina for his master's in, I don't remember now what Bob's master's was in, English, I guess, or history. But anyway, he felt the call to the ministry, and he went to Union Theological Seminary in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And when he finished, he got a fellowship to study in Scotland. So he went to New College at Edinburgh. Yeah. And then Margaret wanted to be a teacher, and she went to Winthrop. And John 
wanted to, felt the call to the ministry too. Mm -hmm. He visited Bob and he wanted to go to the same seminary. Mm -hmm. My husband had gone to Columbia Seminary in Decatur and he really wanted the boys to go there. And that, that was sad for him, but we had to decide that the boys were doing the going this time. <laughs> and he'd had his, so Bob would go to Union and he loved the library there. And John went to visit him and, and they are so much alike. And, and John then felt the call of the ministry, went to the Union Seminary, and when he graduated, got the same fellowship. Mm -hmm. Bob had had a church, a rural church for five years. They had used this fellowship within five years. So when John finished and got it, they went together mm -hmm. to Edinburgh. And that was so nice that they could be in school together in Scotland. But John is, Bob is now pastor of the St. Simons Presbyterian Church in St. Simons, Georgia. And John is pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. where his grandfather founded that church in 1929. It is unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Interesting, interesting. And Margaret is principal in Lexington One, mm -hmm. and this is the second school school that she has founded and become principal. Well, family, the educators, Christian education. I mean, all kinds of again, everything, so anything, bad. just amazing. Ministers. But I have ten wonderful grandchildren, wow. and I want to tell you who they are. I cannot remember their birth dates, <laughs> but I remember their chronological age years, chronological ages, they know where, which finger she has. Each <laughs> one has a finger. This is James. James finished Georgia Tech in engineering and is now in business. This is Will. He finished medical school, mm -hmm. then went into cardiology and then went to interventionists. So he is now a cardiological interventionist in Lexington. Um, Jenny is a physician's assistant at the Moore Clinic. Um, let me see if I got it right. No, I left out David. It's Will, James, Will, David, and David is a lawyer in Rome, Georgia and Jenny is the, with Moore Clinic, and then um, Meg, you met here. Then Hannah is a nurse practitioner with an orthopedic group in Greenville. Kate, my namesake, finished, these are all finished from her, but she finished University of Georgia and in journalism, but she went into went to the seminary and is a, graduated as a minister. And then Michael is finishing Vanderbilt Law School. And might say making all A's, I can't believe it. And then Michael, um, Lauren has finished University Law School and she lives in Myrtle Beach. And Caroline is a student at Furman. And not only that, there are ten great grandchildren. Oh it's goodness. amazing. Oh God's blessings goodness. never cease. So blessed. Yes, they are. And they, the children were older when they married and had their children. Mm -hmm. So their children are young. Mm -hmm. um, all of them are under five, four years old. Um, we have Bennett and English Jane, and Walker, and Claire, and, oh my goodness, don't tell me. This is Jack, this is, this is Ben, <laughs> and the no one's coming in October. Mm -hmm. um, William, William, and um, Ella and well, you 
But anyway, the most wonderful part of it all is they all belong to me. <laughs> That's right. Ten and they are just precious. Ten just so. You're a lot of fingers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Are they ready to eat? I'm I want to ask you two more questions before we, we're going to have a beautiful lunch in here. But before we do, let me just ask you this. What do you think are the most important issues facing women today? I mean, you've done it all. You've worked outside the home. You've worked inside the home. You've raised a generation of, how, what do you think of women today and the issues that women are facing? What, what do you think those are? Well, one thing I, I think is important is that so many of our young people graduate with debt. And so many of our young people, I know there are many who don't have a lot, but there are some who have too much, and they want more. And they go into debt to get more. And I really feel like that debt is a real problem, and so many of our young women think they have to work to pay the debts, mm. and that makes it hard on the home. And I'm so distressed about the breakdown of the family with the um, the violence, the divorce rate, the, the society's just changing, so, and the family is not going to be the strong our country was founded by strong families, mm -hmm. and the children are losing that security. And uh, I think it's important that these mothers do without a lot of things to stay with their children, especially mm -hmm. young children. Mm -hmm. Young children need their mothers at home. and. If they could at least wait until the children are older to start back to school or to work, um, I think I think television is a bad influence on our families and our children, um, and I feel like sometimes we're just too busy with other things that we're not taking time for our children. It was important for me and mine to get together and um, to belong. Mm. They didn't have to go searching somewhere else. To, they were always welcomed and wanted at home and their friends too. And you can't know your children if you're not with them. Mm. And I just, I think that time, we're so busy now. Uh, I don't know if question, I'm saying everything I'm thinking or not. What does feminism mean to you? Well, I really don't know what feminism is. It can be different things. But I consider myself a, a Southern lady, and I demand respect. And I want every woman to be treated with respect. If, if there is a job to be done and a woman can do it, I think she should be given the opportunity and she should be given the pay that that job offers. I don't think she should be denied pay because she is a woman. I think she should get the job. Um, I think if we hadn't had women to fight for women, we wouldn't even be voting today. That's right. But I don't like it in the political sense that I'm having rallies for women and all that. I don't know if that's what feminism means or not. But I, I just think women should have the opportunity to give their service and their talents as they are called to do, and to be paid adequately for it. I think what you said is beautiful. You, you describe yourself as a Southern lady, <laughs> and feminism is about demanding respect and giving women opportunities, including equal pay for their work and the right to vote. 
If that's what feminism is, do you consider Amen. yourself a feminist? I am. Amen to that. I agree. I think I am a feminist. Thank because you. Because I believe in standing up for women's rights. Well said. I, I think God has a plan and a purpose for all of us. And uh, we have our children. And then sometimes when our children are gone or older, we can have other responsibilities. I didn't even mention the fact that I have enjoyed being in other organizations besides the church and the family. I'm a member of Delta Kappa Gamma Society, International State President. Mm. And, uh, what, well, Presbyterian, or President of the Presbyterian for the women of the church. Wow. Whenever they call me, I, I worked. <laughs> it's clear, you, whenever you get the call, you respond. That's right. You have That's been exactly such how I feel. An amazing role model for women. Congratulations on being the South Carolina Mother of the Year. You're an amazing role model to all of us and the future generations of women that will watch your interview and learn from you in this state and beyond. And I just cannot thank you enough for giving us your time today.